Hi, everybody. I am Melanie Teresa King with Thinking is Power, and I am so excited about today's conversation. We're going to talk about science education in an age of misinformation. And to help me with this, I have gathered two amazing science educators. Bertha? Hi, everybody. My name is Bertha Vasquez. I'm the Education Director at the Center for Inquiry. And I will, I'm also a 35-year veteran of the science classroom here in the public school system of Miami-Dade County. And my name is Daniel Pimentel. I'm an assistant professor of science education at the University of Alabama, uh, and also a former science teacher myself. And now I do research on science media literacy and the ways we can help students um, engage with scientific information in the media and use that information to make decisions in their everyday lives. And I also work with uh, folks who want to become science teachers and helping them develop their practice and people who are current science teachers but want to improve their practice. And I'm really excited to be here to chat more with you both. The title of this episode is Science Education in an Age of Misinformation. And that's actually the title of a report that you helped to co-author. So um, the report is linked in the description. But it, do you want to say anything about the report before we get started? Sure. So as you mentioned, the report is called Science Education in an Age of Misinformation. Uh, it was led by my former doctoral advisor at Stanford University, uh, Dr. Jonathan Osborne. And the report was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, where uh, they supported an initiative to bring various experts together. These were experts in science education, in educational psychology, um, in philosophy of science, and uh, also some pretty uh, well-established scientists. And uh, together, we our task was to review literature um, on science learning, but also the state of misinformation, and to try to put together a report recommending uh, a set of uh, steps and guidelines for what we could do in science education, K-12 education specifically, to better address this issue of science misinformation that was a growing concern um, in our society generally, but also we were hearing science teachers having concerns about uh, these issues as well. Okay, so Danny, I'm going to start with um, a question here, and it's a pretty broad one, but what is the purpose of science education? Oh gosh, okay, well you're going to get very different answers to this question, depending on who you ask. And some people might even say that there is no one purpose of science education, that there are multiple purposes for science education. But from the perspective of this report, um, we took the stance that one of the purposes of science education, and a purpose that maybe doesn't get as much emphasis as we would like, is on developing uh, what one scholar, Noah Feinstein, calls the competent outsider. Uh, and a competent outsider is pretty much somebody who is not necessarily an expert themselves, but who has the ability to engage with sources of expertise to find information that they need to accomplish their own goals and purposes. Um, and so, for example, uh, you know, I might not be a an expert um, epidemiologist or an expert in um, infectious disease, but if I'm curious about my likelihood of getting a particular disease, um, I might have skills knowing where to go to find information about that disease, how likely I might be, be to get it depending on certain conditions. Um, and even though I don't have firsthand experience of that knowledge, I know who knows that information, how to access it, um, and also how to avoid being deceived, uh, how to avoid um, information that might not be high quality. And so here, uh, you know, the term outsider is not meant to sort of be divisive or exclusive or to say people can't be scientists. That's not the point. The point is really just as an indicator that you're, you're in this specific moment or for this specific purpose, you're functioning outside of a particular community uh, community of experts. I love that term. And actually, I would argue that um, even scientists should be competent outsiders outside of their areas of expertise. And so, um, you know, like my background is plant ecology, right? When I, epidemiology is not my area of expertise. So I hope to be a competent outsider in those other fields. Um, so 
Bertha, um, how does science education work today? Are we meeting these goals? What does a typical science educator do during the day? I think that's a really important question to clarify from the start, because when I talk to people who haven't been in a science classroom in a very long time, they are assuming it's go to the back of the chapter, memorize the vocabulary and answer the questions. And I want to stress before we begin, you know, this conversation is that that is not what science education is today. Um, science education today does include what DNGSS or that we should call it let's say it's next generation science standards, which are national science standards. They haven't been adopted by all the states, but they, whatever your state standards are, if they're not NGSS standards, they're kind of modeled on NGSS standards, most of them. Okay, and we will talk about that more. But there's a lot of skills that science teachers are teaching. It's not memorization of vocabulary. And I think to this day, there's a disconnect in college. They're still doing a lot of lecture and they're still doing a lot of memorization. In K-12 education, it's letting the kids explore, letting the kids discover, gathering evidence, communicating their evidence, analyzing the evidence. And I know Danny's going to talk about the pros and cons of this, but I just want to make clear that, that if your science education, if you're listening to this, was about memorizing the 10 vocabulary words at the back of chapter 10, pretty much nobody's doing that these days. There is a lot of thinking skills and reading skills incorporated in science education today. But that leads us to our definition of critical thinking. Yeah, so um, Bertha and I have um, an interesting history where um, I wrote an article. So my background is um, I teach uh, non-major science at a college. And these are people who don't want to be scientists when they grow up. And I was teaching biology and um, I was doing a lot. Actually, that's not entirely true. Um, biology is content heavy and I was using content, but I was also using it to help students think through issues. So for example, when um, I covered um, cellular reproduction, mitosis, I used cancer to help my students understand the kinds of cellular, the, the, the proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and the kinds of things, uh, mutations that could lead to unregulated cell growth. But I still realized that um, I was kind of feeling my students in that if I had a single semester to teach my students what they needed to know about science, they were going to forget all of that. And that probably wasn't even what they needed to know about cancer. I wanted them to be competent outsiders. I just didn't know that term. I wanted them to be able to find the information that they needed when they needed it. Right. And so um, I uh, redesigned a course and I wrote an article called Teach Skills Not Facts, in which I talked about critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy. And I, I met Bertha in this process, and we we had some um, interesting um, and productive conflict on this yes. over the years, because she's like, Melanie, we do teach critical thinking. And I, what I think is so ironic about this is that, um, you know, step one in critical thinking when having productive arguments is to define terms. And we were talking past each other and what this term went, meant. So she was using, from what I understand now, and please both of you correct me if I'm wrong, because you know the standards way better than I do. Um, she was using the, the critical thinking definition in the standards, which is um, inquiry-based, problem-solving, um, thinking like a scientist. And I was asking my students to think about how they come to their beliefs and to question them in a healthy way, to um, try to understand the kinds of biases that lead them astray, to how to find reliable sources. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to add anything on that. No, just that I realized that we, we teachers taught the skills as I saw them, but we, I don't really think, and I don't want to speak for everybody out there, but I don't think teachers are out there teaching the skills the way you define it. And that we really should, because your skills are the reason why we need yeah. the skills that we cover in the classroom. We need kids to understand why there's double blind protocol, why there's multiple samples, why you search for credible information. Because of your biases, your perceptions, your experiences, your identities, and how they color, how you, you know, it's almost like a filter that every, all new information that you encounter gets processed through to develop your own idea or understanding of something. So yeah. you're the metacognition. It is metacognition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on this, especially how they relate to the standards. And again, like big picture here, what are we doing here as science educators? So there's a what we do and in a perfect world, what might we do better? Um, but to me, um, I, I teach other courses that start like the traditional way. Here's the scientific method. And then here's the kinds of things that we've learned through that. 
what I've realized doing that is that um, it leaves students not understanding why we need science to begin with. Right. And so helping them first understand their thinking and why, you know, I tried something and felt better isn't sufficient or why I know what I saw isn't sufficient evidence. And, and so um, I actually find the students make better sense of how science works once they understand the problem that science is trying to solve for. Um, so I, I guess, Danny, to you, um, we, we've been talking for a while now. Thoughts on what we've said and how they relate to the nature of science, maybe, and the standards or... Any thoughts? Yeah. So with critical thinking, I think that there are at least two kinds of ways to, or two different ways to approach critical thinking um, uh, in terms of like what the what you're critically thinking about. So you can critically, I, I think, think about uh, and try to evaluate information in a sort of firsthand kind of way. So I'm trying to evaluate a specific claim. Um, or you can try to evaluate where that information is coming from. Um, and both of those uh, approaches involve knowledge, but they involve different kinds of knowledge. Um, so if I'm going to evaluate um, scientific uh, a, a scientific claim or scientific argument, then I think having an understanding of the scientific practices is useful, but you also need to have pretty in-depth knowledge of that science, right? So you need to have an understanding of um, the, the body of knowledge up until that point and sort of all the ideas that have been tried, all of the ideas that have been discounted. You have to be able to think through um, uh, all of the various claims and why certain things are true and why they're not and why scientists use certain methods. Um, and, uh, that can be really challenging if you don't have expertise in that domain, as we've said. And I think as we've all probably will realize, we can't be experts in everything. So our ability to do that firsthand evaluation um, is gonna be limited in a lot of contexts. Now, this sort of secondhand approach where we critically think about where our information is coming from also requires some knowledge, but the knowledge is different. It, it requires an understanding of how science works but at a bit larger scale. It involves you know, understanding um, sort of how science produces reliable knowledge, what are the various checks and balances on that, and how does science go about establishing sort of credible sources of information? And you can use that knowledge to evaluate um, maybe not the specific knowledge claims or the specific scientific claims, but at least where the knowledge is coming from. And I think the reason why, uh, I don't think that's what gets emphasized as much in the science classroom uh, currently. And the reason why I think that that's a useful way forward, and I think an argument um, that aligns with what we say in the report is like that knowledge about how science works at a larger level is a bit more stable. You know, peer review has been around for a while. Um, the process of establishing expertise has been around for a while. This role of scientific consensus, um, you know, you can look to that and the idea that that's gonna change anytime soon, um, I think it is a bit far off as compared to with specific knowledge claims and specific methodologies, that stuff is being updated all of the time. Um, there are certain things that are consistent, you know, like controlled experiments and that sort of thing, but how those get applied in specific disciplines um, is very idiosyncratic. And so um, I think I would say that I think critical critical thinking can mean many things. Uh, those are at least two ways. And I haven't even talked about, Melanie, what you were talking about in terms of critically thinking about your own thinking, um, your own biases, the way your own sort of uh, the metacognitive aspects of, of your thinking. But I think that's another, at least another component of this. And so, um, yeah, I would say that... Uh, critical thinking is a very big term and, and, it, and it kind of gets used in all of these different ways. And, and so, um, as I mentioned, a challenge, at least with the way the NGSS and current science education has set up what we should focus on with the practices you mentioned, Bertha, around, you know, teaching students to design investigations the way a scientist would, or teaching students to develop models the way a scientist would, is that sort of once we leave the context of the science classroom and we move to sort of an everyday environment, we might not always be in a position to do that firsthand kind of knowledge building and to think critically in that kind of way. 
Um, instead, we were more in a position oftentimes to do that sort of secondhand evaluation. Do I know where this information is coming from and if it's a credible uh, source of information because I maybe don't have access to the instruments they used or the you know highly advanced modeling tools that they used or even like the specific disciplinary knowledge to question the assumptions that are built into a climate change model, for example. And so um, I, I think the idea here is uh, there are many ways to engage in critical thinking and uh, we want to try to sort of expand students' repertoires beyond just that firsthand evaluation and also teach them and provide them with opportunities to learn how to do this second, this more sort of second hand type invest uh, critical uh, approach, which uh, is likely to be useful in everyday contexts. So um, I, when I read your report, uh, the report that you co-authored, um, I, I was like, almost screaming out loud, <laughs> like, yes. And I was taking notes and just like, wow, I yes, I'm so glad you're saying this. Um, and one of the things that I got from that, and I, I'm curious how they fit into the NGSS, if they do, um, what I heard was that um, each of us, it's important to know what we don't know and to know where to find that knowledge. So even scientists, let's say that I, I'm trying to find uh, solve a problem. I, I'm not going to start over from scratch and design my own experiments. I, I'm going to figure out what is already known. Where is that knowledge? Recognize that the process of science is a process of producing reliable knowledge and um, use that information as a place to start from. In that is trust in the process of science as it works. Um, the recognition that none of us are independent thinkers. Um, we all think socially and science, the social process helps to vet that knowledge. So I guess, um, are, is it, are these things part of how we currently teach science? This is to both of you. I think, yeah, I can say, I think that, and there are people who have written about this, um, the NGSS, the, as we mentioned, the next generation science standards, I think has definitely moved us um, a step forward in this direction because the idea is um, it engages students in some of those social processes, right? Like they are engaged in argumentation so that they try, it helps students develop an understanding that, you know, uh, when scientists are building an explanation for something, it is this social process of arguing from evidence and sort of looking for gaps in our understanding and trying to, so that helps students understand sort of what scientists are doing. Uh, and sort of, I think helps dispel the myth that scientists are just going out and observing things and like looking at the objective uh, truth and just sort of like writing it down and sharing it, right? That it is the social construction of, of um, knowledge, of course, using empirical evidence and, and trying to adhere very closely uh, to, to what the evidence is telling us. Um, the challenge, I think, is that um, if we only stick there, stay there in terms of engaging students in those practices, without then helping them sort of take a step back to say, okay, this is what scientists are doing um, when they're in their scientific professional setting, what does that then mean for us if we're not professional scientists ourselves in terms of how we go about finding information in our own lives? I think we don't, we do that first part really well. And I think that there's an, an additional step of then saying, okay, if this is how science works, what does that mean for those of us who might not become professional scientists in terms of what we should look for when scientific information is being communicated to us? So moving from that this is what scientists do sort of at the individual or even at the lab level to that's how this informs the way science as a system and as an institution works. Mm -hmm. And that we can look for, um, you know, this particular person is sharing this information with me. Well, I know that scientists are supposed to engage in, um, you know, critical evaluative discourse. So I'm going to look for a peer review uh, process to make sure that this scientific information was vetted, right? I, uh, knowing that argumentation is an aspect of science is one thing, but knowing how that translates into sort of an institutional process that I can look for, 
as an everyday citizen is I think where where we don't emphasize enough in the class currently. And I think where we could improve um, in terms of helping students become competent outsiders. Bertha, you were um, telling me about a lab that you had your students do. Yeah. And um, it's a great lab, but yeah, go ahead. Tell well, I, I, well as, since we're basically talking about the pros and cons to NGSS, and we all agree that it's a wonderful document and it's a big step forward, but coming my personal anecdote is coming from a state that is not a next generation science standard state, that's Florida. And I went to a National Association of Biology Teachers uh, conference, and I went to an HHMI session. I think they're amazing. It's like the gold standard of uh, evolution resources, HHMI. Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Yes, Howard Hughes yep. Medical Institute. So they have this wonderful lab called the Biology of Human Skin Color. And it takes you through why humans started off with lighter skin, our skin got darker, and then in some parts of the world, our skin got lighter again. And what surprised me coming from a non-NGSS state was they said, do this on the first day of school. And I would never, like in my brain, I was like, okay, this fits kind of in February. I was already thinking, where is this gonna go? They said, let the kids figure it out, do it on the first day of school. And I thought, shoot, you know, I think I'm a pretty good teacher and I've been doing this wrong the whole time. I've been giving them content. Oh no, you're supposed to let them figure out the content. I go, okay, I'm gonna go back. And mind you, these are the, I taught probably the most advanced eighth graders in the state of Florida. These kids were amazing, beautiful, smart, engaged, curious, intellectual kids. First day of school, it was a total fail. It was a disaster. They didn't understand what was going on. The following year, I put it where I thought it should go. After teaching biomolecules and nucleic acids, after teaching genetics, basic stuff like Punnett squares and Mendel, after teaching gene regulation, after teaching alleles, after teaching evolution, and, and I taught it in the natural selection area. So I gave them the content. Brilliant lab. When I taught it 10 years after that. And the last day of school, when I asked them, what was your favorite activity? Many, many students always said, oh, the biology of human skin color, that HHMI lab, it's fantastic. Which the reason I'm bringing that up is it goes to your point that kids need to understand that scientists know stuff before they try to figure stuff out. You know, we can't assume that people just go figure it out. They, they, they have to understand how science works and content is actually important. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think, I think you're pointing to, to something that, you know, we talk about in research and in studies of learning, which is, um, you know, we can't critically think without information to critically think about. Exactly. Uh, and you can't so just throw something at students and say, figure it out. No, I mean, they have to have that scientists don't do that. Right. But also right. under the problem solving definition of critical thinking, just putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. So for example, another, uh, you can imagine another activity um, where students are being given different sources of information, um, making different claims about the origins of um, skin, uh, you know, skin tones and that sort of thing. Um, and then being tasked with figuring out, well, which of these sources of information um, are likely to be credible uh, sources of scientific information or likely to be more accurate. And then using, and then, you know, making decisions about which sources they want to use to construct an explanation as a part of a larger investigation. Um, and that way, you know, um, students are, are practicing the skill of um, well, I do need to rely on other people to learn, um, but I need to be selective about which people I'm going to rely on for my scientific information, assuming I want to know that the scientific information um, and using that to help develop an explanation. Now, I do want to say, I think there is a place for engaging students in these sort of guided inquiry experiences. I just think that in designing those experiences, you, we need to make sure we're giving students the tools and the resources they need to have access to the information to construct the explanations, right? So we want to make sure 
if students have to do some sort of inquiry lesson to explain, um, you know, why some objects sink and why some objects float in water, we want to make sure they have access to all of the information they're going to need or, or have resources to build the explanation they'll need. Um, right. uh, or you, yeah, I could picture you starting with a beaker full of water and cubes of wood and cubes of lead and okay, throw this in the water. Why does one float and why does one sink? And then stop, get them thinking, and then have to give them some background on density and buoyancy and those kinds of things. And then they can keep going with their investigation. But I feel like they, they need some content. Well, Daniel, you mentioned it because in the report, you talk about it's science education in an age of misinformation, right? right? And what you're saying here is that sources are important. Yeah. It's important to know where to find information and how to vet the quality of a source. Was that part of that lab at all? No. And I think that's an important point that we want to talk about. In my science classroom, when I give them that, there was it was full of the scientists that figured all this stuff out. But the kids assume in my class, I'm not going to give them misinformation. The sources that I'm giving them, like they're assuming this V is giving us these people really know what they're talking about. But the problem is that they're going to go outside into the world. And this is a misinformation that you guys are talking about. And somebody that's not going to be good sources. So yeah. how do you get them prepared to analyze what's a good source and what's a not a good source? Yeah. And I think you're pointing to a really good point that, you know, has been increasingly talked about, um, you know, by ac academics studying um, science education and also just how people think about knowledge and and knowing and, and that sort of thing. Um, we intentionally curate science classrooms to be what we would call sort of like intellectually friendly places. Um, we give students largely vetted credible sources um, because we want them to focus on thinking with that information um, uh, because those are the goals we have, right? Like we want students to think with this information so they can learn this thing and apply this thing and explain this thing. Um, but we might be doing a bit of a disservice in the context of science if that creates this sort of disposition that anytime I get a source of scientific information, it's probably credible. Exactly. Uh, and so, <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we need to build th this sort of disposition, this sort of sense of, um, uh, you know, mindfulness, some might call it a vigilance towards not all of the sources I get are going to be vetted and credible in my everyday life. Um, and introducing students to some sources that are not credible, maybe helping them experience that sense of being deceived and then sh showing them what to look for. In fact, I worked with a student um, this past year. She was very interested in some of these ideas that I talked about in one of our classes. And um, she designed a lesson where uh, she gave students a website um, and said, I want you to, uh, her students were familiar with a framework called Claim Evidence Reasoning. Yeah, everybody, yeah, that's a big one. The big one, and it's used to develop a, a scientific argument, uh, sometimes a scientific explanation. And she said, I want you to develop an argument uh, using CER to explain, um, uh, to make it, to make a, an argument about uh, something in this article. And students did that. And then, and they, you know, they all wrote their CER, students were working in pairs. And then after, and she had them share them out. And then she was like, hmm, uh, did anyone notice anything strange about the article at all? And, and, you know, then kids were like, oh, you know, yeah, I did notice this thing, but you know, you told us to do the CER. So we were just, you know, we, we were doing our task. We were doing the CER. And, and so more students started like, yeah, this thing kind of looks strange. And yeah, this thing kind of looks strange. And she's like, S so what does that make you think? And they're like, should we, they're like, we need to look into this. So she's like, okay, what should we do? And so then they started looking into the source of information and found out that the website was fabricated. It was fake. Um, and that sort of helps students have this experience of, wow, like uh, before I just dive into using this source of information, I need to check if it's worth my time. And that's yeah. something that I think is really challenging with, again, this orientation toward just do the science practice, um, you know, teaching argument from evidence, because um, you can argue from evidence using a source on the internet that is completely fake, that was Perfect. designed to look convincing. Um, and so before we get to let's use this information, I think we need to take a, a, uh, a step before that, which is, is this information worth critically thinking about? 
Um, and, and yes. Go no. ahead, you go. No, because I, I, yes, 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 yes. Mm. I would argue one step further back, which is why would I be fooled by this misinformation? Mm. Because it, what I find as a science communicator online is that um, if somebody wants to believe something, they're going to go even to Google Scholar and they're going to type in what they think is true. And they're going to find a study that says, because quite frankly, you can even find a study that says anything. It may be in a pay to publish journal. It may be in a, just a low quality journal, um, but they've got science, right? So misinformation, to recognize misinformation, we need to understand why we fall for it and those characteristics of the misinformation. And um, I guess the point here is none of this is currently in the science classroom. No, and it's a big ask. Yeah. This is a big ask. So you're saying on top of the <laughs> way, you know, let's say you do teach the biology of human skin color in the right place. You have to teach kids, A, or is the, outside this classroom, some sources of misinformation are not credible? And B, why would you fall mm -hmm. for a source of misinformation that's not credible? Those are the two big takeaways here, I think, is... Yeah, we're doing a good job. The NGSS is fantastic. But how do we teach kids that there is misinformation? And how do we teach kids to analyze and look for it and why they fall for it? That's a big ask. And I, I know we've talked about mentioning this at the end, but I think this is a good place to say teachers cannot do this alone. We need this to expand beyond the classroom into journalism, into media, into other, I don't think I can do this alone in the classroom. I don't know if you will have something to say about that. I would like to, I mean, I would like to add that I, I think that even though the tools we currently have as science educators are not perfect, there are four teachers that are interested and that are inspired by what they're hearing, you know, with, with our conversations and say they read the report and, you know, they want to do something and they're like, where, where do I start? I think one entryway is in the eighth science and engineering practice called obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. Um, now, I, I would argue, and I think in the report, we argue that that practice seems to be a bit underdeveloped from the perspective of what we're saying in terms of the competent outsider approach, but it does talk about, um, you know, I evaluating the, the credibility and reliability of a source, determining whether a, a source is an authoritative source of information to be using. Um, now, I would, I would still argue a lot of their framing of how to do that is from this sort of as a scientist lens, like go in and look at um, and evaluate the sort of uh, the argument as though you are an expert. Um, but still, I think there are ways to do that evaluation from this sort of um, outsider perspective. And some of the ways to do that are incorporating some strategies that we outline in the report, like lateral reading, which involves um, you know, moving off of a web page and sort of tapping into um, what other sources have to say, um, knowing which websites to go to, like Wikipedia um, being, you know, students in a study that I ran uh, would go to Wikipedia when I asked them if a source was credible or not, and they did lateral reading to do a search. Right before clicking on Wikipedia, they would say, I know I'm not supposed to go to Wikipedia because my teachers told me not to, but but I find it usually pretty useful. So I'm going to go there. Right. So I think there are small things even like that in a classroom where, you know, as a teacher, maybe not saying like, don't use Wikipedia for science information. Wikipedia can, can actually be pretty useful for doing research and uh, about scientific information, assuming that you know how to use it, uh, which, you know, we could get into that. We talk about it a little bit in the report and there are others doing great work to educate people about this, like the digital inquiry group um, who talks a lot about online reasoning and how to apply it across the curriculum, science being one of them. So I think there are tools out there and there are ways into this for teachers who want to, um, take small steps uh, towards towards doing these kinds of things. Even if it's just, you know, giving students a claim, uh, giving students a claim at the beginning of class as a sort of do now or bell ringer activity and saying, is this true or not? And how would you figure it out? And just spending, you know, five to 10 minutes at the beginning of class. Um, and there are folks who have written about that. Uh, Andy Zucker being one person, teachers could look into their activities 
published in um, the Science Teacher magazine uh, um, and other places. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking, but yeah. Well, I think if you want to talk about resources, um, I want to plug Thinking is Power in the Science for Life course that Melanie has developed. And my uh, project, generationskeptics.org, actually has something exactly like that. Two websites, which one's more credible? Two articles, which one's more credible? Two advertisements, which one's more credible? And it teaches kids to go through from easy ones and they get more and more complex as you go along. So definitely check out, you'll put them in the link, thinking yep. is power and generationskeptics.org. And speaking of bell ringers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, cause <laughs> I'm spend time online creating content and Bertha came to me and said, you, you've got these great videos. I bet we could use these as bell ringers. So we've put together about 60 of my short videos and she put them in order and put reflection questions and all of that's also available at Jen's Gaps, right? Yeah, and you can and link to that because again, I go back to the teachers have too much to cover in a given year. We don't have that much wiggle room when it comes to spending, you know, a month on why you believe what you believe and start with humility and all the important things before you start looking for credibility in a source. So we thought if you just start your class with these bell ringers, two to three minutes every day, there's about 60 plus at this time, and you can move on and start teaching your content. It won't really dig into your class time, but it will introduce these topics so that when you get to a topic like evolution or climate change or GMOs or something like that, where there is a lot of misinformation out there, they're more likely to understand why some sources are more credible than others. Um, yeah, and I would just add that, you know, Bertha, you'd mentioned, uh, isn't this a lot to put on science teachers? And I and I, I think that we cannot um, put the burden of all of science misinformation onto science teachers. This is a large uh, issue that is going to require solutions from a lot of different angles. And I think science teachers shouldn't feel like they have to solve this problem. But I think to the extent that science teachers feel as though they have something to offer and to contribute and that they feel passionate about doing so, that they're not helpless and that they can't do it, nothing. Um, I think that's fantastic. I think that's a big takeaway here and that there are resources out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and other other levers are, for example, thinking about curriculum developers. And uh, uh, I know sometimes science teachers are developing their own curriculum, uh, but there are also organizations that develop curriculum. And, and um, I've worked with uh, a group of folks to create a document outlining what are some key principles uh, that you could use to design curriculum to better address some of the things we're talking about. How do you talk about aspects of science as a social and institutional process? How do you incorporate more explicitly um, these uh, information evaluation strategies for the internet and various strategies? And maybe we can link that document as well. And I bring that up because yes, that was the target audience for that paper is curriculum developers. But to the extent that, that those guidelines are useful for a science teacher who might be designing like a week unit for themselves or you know has time at the beginning of the school year or at the end of the school year after exams are over to design a little um, investigation, maybe those principles could be helpful for them too. Um, all these resources, I'm gonna link in the description. Um, I think we've pretty much hit everything. Yeah, the, I just wanna circle back to misinformation because I, I think um, we're trying to address um, science education, um, improve it however we can, um, but also recognize that the world is full of misinformation. One of the things that I have discovered about misinformation is that it can help students understand what better information looks like. So I purposefully use misinformation in class to teach, here's what pseudoscience looks like. Then they can help see what science looks like, science denial, conspiracy theories, all of that, um, fake news, by including it purposefully yeah. and letting students see the characteristics. And even in, I create curriculum that um, where students create misinformation. And I'll link to that as well, mentalimmunityproject.org, where um, by creating the misinformation using those characteristics, they learn the qualities of the better information. So I would say um, as, as educators, it's an opportunity actually 
to help your students understand how science works and why some sources are more reliable than others. Right. I think I, there was a study done by the National Center for Science Education that showed that it was like a, this, an alarming number of teachers pro, teach intelligent design, which is an alternative understanding. Yeah, it's not a true scientific theory as they, they contrast it to evolution. But what half of those 26% of the teachers were doing was exactly what you're saying. They're saying this is intelligent design, this is what they're saying, and this is why it's not true science. So right. there are people doing out that out there. Yeah, I would say uh, from the uh, you know, to the extent that this is useful to think about it in this way, we would call that negative knowledge, right? It's important to know uh, how something is wrong and why something is wrong because that helps you know when something is right and why something is right. And and there's a good argument made by um, a science educator called, named Douglas Alchin who argues that we should design maybe do more designing of the science curriculum around errors in science because showing how when and how science makes mistakes helps us understand when and how science uh, does a good job of producing reliable knowledge. And so um, the more we can incorporate things like that, I think does a good job of both helping students understand science as a social process. It also provides opportunities to incorporate misinformation and it helps students understand science better. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, you two, um, I love you both. You're amazing. Um, any final thoughts? No, I, I think that was a good conversation. I think we really came full circle and start with humility. Teach kids in your classroom humility. Not everything you believe is true. And humility is absolutely essential in scientific inquiry. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Thank you all. <laughs>